I am pleased to introduce today's moderator. John Palfrey is president of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, one of the nation's largest philanthropies. He is a well-respected educator, author, legal scholar, and innovator with expertise in how new media is changing learning, education, and other institutions. Thank you, John, for your important work and serving as today's moderator. It is wonderful to have such a great turnout on such an important topic and uh, to the staff who have put this event together. Um, on behalf of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, which I have the uh, privilege to be president of, we are uh, very glad to be helping to fund this work. And today I'm very honored to be uh, able to be moderating this conversation. From the outset, I just wanna say why this is so important to a large funder like MacArthur. We are not a funder that has done a lot of uh, work in the health equity zone, but like many others, we uh, found that in the pandemic, the way in which these issues associated with COVID-19 and the recovery intersect with many things that we care about that we felt like we, like many others, had to step up forward and to do more. Um, our approach was to raise a series of bonds, $125 million in bonds, so that we'd be able to do this work as well as to keep our other programs going. And we're so honored to be partnering uh, with the great team today in uh, helping to bring out this work and to have this conversation. I think that you are all aware that we're here because there's a second round of survey findings that has uh, come forth. We congratulate the team on the release of these data today, which are already in the news media, and we get a first-hand uh, front row seat here to be able to discuss it with a group of experts. This is, of course, highlighting religious identities and the race against the virus, and it's the largest study conducted to date focusing on the dynamics of how faith-based interventions can mitigate vaccine hesitancy and resistance. Um, this study, which is conducted by the Public Religion Research Institute and IFYC, from whom you will hear shortly, reveals that faith-based approaches supporting vaccine uptake can influence key hesitant groups to get vaccinated and is thus a vital tool as we seek to recover in an equitable way and inclusive way from this uh, pandemic. Um, I would say MacArthur is particularly proud to support IFYC's implementation strategies, and we encourage our philanthropic partners to get involved in this way. Um, a couple of things that we will learn from the report, just to, to lodge a few in your head as we go forward. Vaccine hesitancy, the good news is down and acceptance is up. Uh, Faith-based approaches still have the potential to be effective for hesitant and refusing groups, and we know there are many out there. Um, there is evidence that these strategies have impacted decisions by individuals uh, uh, within communities, so that is extremely positive news. The opportunities for increasing vaccine uptake are evident in substantial portions of Black, Hispanic, and younger Americans reporting logistical barriers to getting vaccinated. So these are, I think, very important findings from the perspective of public policy and those who are trying to ensure the infrastructure is there uh, for vaccination. Partisanship, education, and age remain key dividing factors in attitudes related to this vaccine. So as we all struggle with what these data are telling us, um, we can learn from them. They will give us a roadmap, I think, to um, find our way uh, forward again through uh, through this time into a more equitable and inclusive recovery. Um, and I'm excited that we are joined by uh, such great thinkers who are uh, here with us today. Let me just reintroduce to you briefly um, Ibu, Rabi, uh, Natalie, and Tanya um, with their official bios, and I'm going to turn it over uh, to Rabi to begin. Um, but let me just read to you uh, the short bios of each of these extraordinary people. So first off, Ibu Patel founded IFYC on the idea that religion should be a bridge of cooperation rather than a barrier of division. He served in an advisor role to the Obama administration, is a sought after and much uh, very well regarded speaker, um, and has written several books, including Acts of Faith, Sacred Ground, Interfaith Leadership, and Out of Many Faiths. Dr. Tanya Sorrell is Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Rush University Medical Center, Director of the Illinois Regional Leadership Centers for Regions 1 and 2, and Assistant Director of the Great Lakes NIH, uh, NIDA Clinical Trials Network Node. Her publications focus on usually using culturally based approaches to improve behavioral health and substance treatment of rural and urban underserved populations. Natalie Jackson is Director of Research at PRRI. She has spent the last 15 years developing extensive expertise in the survey research process as well as quantitative political science. Her research on how people form opinions has appeared in peer reviewed journals and edited volumes. And last but certainly not least, and the person who will kick us off from here, Robert P. Jones is CEO and founder of PRRI and a leading scholar and commentator on religion, culture, and politics. 
He's the author of Wait Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity and The End of White Christian America. You can see him regularly writing online uh, and um, uh, on television related to politics, culture, religion for the Atlantic Online, NBC Think, and other institutions. Um, if I might, I'll turn it over to Robbie to take us away. Great. Well, thanks, John. Um, thank you all of you for joining us today. I'm going to uh, just say a very quick uh, a brief remarks and then hand it over to Natalie, who will walk us through the first set of findings. Um, just want to emphasize um, how um, pleased we are to be in this partnership with IFYC that is a unique uh, partnership between research and practice and implementation. I think you'll see that more of that later, but um, you know, this is the second wave, as John said, of the, of the research. We did one wave in March uh, driving um, some interventions uh, in, into the summer, and then we're doing another wave this summer driving interventions um, into the fall. Each of these is a feedback loop into the research um, as well. So we're very pleased with that. Um, and I won't, you'll hear more from me in just a moment, but I will turn it over to um, Natalie Jackson to walk us through um, the beginning of the presentation. Let me get this up. Great, thank you. Um, Robbie, can you uh, share the presentation mode? There we go. Perfect. So just a little bit about the survey. The survey that we're talking about today is wave two of a very large survey that we've conducted on vaccines, religion, uh, hesitancy, and lots of other things that you'll see pieces of throughout today's presentation. Um, we can dive really pretty deeply into religious groups and into demographic subgroups because this is a large survey. The total sample size is 5,851. Um, that means we have a relatively small margin of error, but as with any survey, of course, there is um, a margin of error on it. Um, the survey was conducted throughout June. Uh, the first survey that we're comparing to was conducted in March. So with that, we will jump into some of the key findings. First off, just to set the stage, um, we have seen considerable increase in vaccine acceptance since March. Um, this is in line with numbers that the CDC has put out. Um, we have 67% as of June vaccinated with at least one dose. Um, we're a little bit beyond that now as you know, a little bit of time has passed, but that, that was pretty close to the CDC count at the end of June. We've seen a su substantial decrease in the number of Americans who are vaccine hesitant. It does seem like people who said they wanted to wait and see really did want to wait and see what would happen. So we've had a reduction in the wait and see people from 19% to 10%. Overall hesitancy has decreased from 28% to 15%. The less great news is that the vaccine refusers have held steady. So people who don't wanna get the vaccine still don't really wanna get the vaccine. We'll talk about a couple of exceptions to that, uh, but that, that's the overall landscape. We, we'll go next to religious groups. So at the, the least vaccine acceptant religious groups are Hispanic Protestants and white evangelical Protestants. We do see that both of them have increased in vaccine acceptance by more than 10 percentage points since Mar March. Um, however, uh, white evangelicals remain about a quarter refusers. Um, the good news with Hispanic Protestants is that whereas 42% were hesitant in March, now it's reduced to 26%. If we look at the next set of religious groups, we have a cluster that are above that 70% mark that the U.S. was kind of aiming for to, to get us into possibly a herd immunity status. So white mainline Protestants, these are anybody who's not evangelical, 
religiously unaffiliated people, other Christians, this includes um, Jehovah's Witnesses, Christians of color that are not in any of the other subgroups, white Catholics, Hispanic Catholics, and Jewish people. These are all almost three quarters or more um, vaccine acceptant. And I wanna particularly point out the jump in Hispanic Catholic acceptance since March. This, this group has moved the most. They were 56% acceptors in March and have boomed to 80%. Um, another, uh, the center group that's still missing here, uh, we'll bring those up. We see that these groups, Latter-day Saints, Black Protestants, other Protestants of color, these groups are hanging around the two-thirds acceptant mark. Um, one important note about Black Protestants is that their uh, reluctance has decreased, the, their hesitancy has decreased, as well as their refuser rate. This is one of those exceptions. In March, 19% said they would refuse to get the vaccine, and in June, that's dropped to 13%. So that, that's a, a, good, a second good news story that we have from this slide. Moving on to partisanship. Um, if you're on this webinar, you're interested in this topic, you probably are aware of the partisan split in vaccine acceptance and refusal. Uh, we have Democrats at 85% acceptance, only 4% refuser. Um, independents just above that 70% mark, only 12% refuser rate. And then Republicans kind of lagging behind, still more than 60%, so not, not too terrible. They have increased the most over their March rate. Uh, that's an 18 percentage point increase. Um, but still one in five are say they won't get vaccinated at all. So we take a closer look to Republicans since we have you know, this very large data set. And we, the first cut that we are going to look at is conspiracy theory beliefs. So we asked some questions on this survey about belief in QAnon conspiracy theories. Those who believe in QAnon conspiracy theories are less likely to be vaccine acceptant. You see it at the very bottom there, they're 45% vaccine acceptant. 37% say they will refuse to get the vaccine. That's quite a bit more than most other Republican groups, even within this, you know, diving into the Republican subcategories. People who really kind of don't think QAnon is a thing and people who reject QAnon are much more likely to be vaccine acceptant. The other split that we took a closer look at is news sources. So among Republicans who trust mainstream news, most out of television news sources, they're almost 80% vaccine acceptant, 77%, very few refusers. Fox News is actually not that far behind either. 64% of Republicans who trust Fox News um, are vaccine acceptant. So, you know, that's an interesting note as we see a recent pivot in the last week to two weeks with Fox News. Remember this data was collected in June, so you know, those, those were not necessarily the Republicans that were falling so far behind. When we get to Republicans who don't watch television news or who pay, who trust far right news, this would be One America News Network or Newsmax or similar, we see much less vaccine acceptance, particularly among the far right news trusters. This is only about 5% of Republicans, but 46% indicate that they are vaccine refusers, which is a very large chunk. And then finally, if we split Republicans by religion, we hear, hear about how white evangelical Protestants are very active within the party. We do see a divide there as well. White evangelical Republicans are lagging behind in vaccine acceptance rates compared to those who are any other 
religion. Um, and again, white evangelicals have a higher refuser rate than other groups. When we looked at, at this in March, we picked out the, all the groups that had 50% or more in the vaccine hesitant or refuser category. And those are these groups. So how have they progressed? Well, if we look at the religious groups that hit that 50% plus mark, we see that white evangelical Protestants and Hispanic Protestants are still at the top end. They, they're still experiencing the highest rates of hesitancy and refusal um, with, of course, again, white evangelicals notable for their high refusal rate. Down at the bottom, we have Latter-day Saints, Black Protestants, and other Protestants of color who remain more hesitant than refuser, um, notably with some reduction in the refuser rates for them. Then in the middle, we have rural Americans, Republicans, multiracial Americans, young Americans, and all Black Americans, most of whom have remained steady in their refusals and have decreased in their hesitancy. So the, the good news from this slide is that all of these groups were at or above 50% hesitant and refuser in March. And now everyone is 40% or below. We really only have white evangelical Protestants and Hispanic Protestants hanging out near that 40% mark. Everyone else has fallen much lower. So we do see a lot of success in reducing hes hesitancy in particular among groups that were very hesitant. And from there, I will hand it over to Ravi. Great, uh, thanks Natalie. Uh, well, that's kind of the lay of the land of kind of how things have progressed between March and June. Uh, and I'm gonna turn to um, talk specifically about the impact of faith-based approaches on vaccine uptake. Um, so here, uh, what we did in the survey is that we uh, tested the impact of 10 faith-based approaches on vaccine acceptance. Um, these are things that uh, really were getting underway in our, March, uh, in our March survey data, but were more underway in the spring. Uh, and there are a range of things that, uh, as you can see here, I won't read them all, but uh, you, know, a, you could get the vaccine at a nearby religious congregation, a religious leader you trust got the vaccine or a community held a, a forum to discuss the safety um, of, of the vaccine. So these uh, kinds of interventions. And then we asked people uh, both who had been vaccinated and who were still hesitant or uh, refusers, um, uh, whether these kinds of interventions had made a difference if they had gotten a vaccine or whether they would make a difference um, if they had not um, uh, gotten a vaccine. And so I'm gonna present that data uh, to you now. So first, uh, what does it look like among the people who, um, who are vaccinated? And we asked them whether um, one or more of these faith-based approaches made them more likely uh, to get a shot in the arm. Uh, here are the numbers of, of some key religious groups uh, overall. Um, and you can see the effects are actually pretty large. Um, they have upwards of 40% of Hispanic Protestants, uh, about three in 10 um, African-American Protestants, a quarter of Hispanic Catholics um, and a little more than one in five white evangelical Protestants um, uh, say that who got vaccinated say that one or more of these faith-based approaches made them more likely to do it. Uh, the effects are a little smaller among white Catholics and white mainline Protestants, um, but it's notable as I think particularly among places like Latino Protestants and white evangelical Protestants where in their communal context, this was sort of a headwind. Uh, there was a lot of refusal, a lot of skepticism, and so in effect this big saying that it pushed them over the line, um, you know, it was a fairly large one. And then if we look at those who are kind of more closely attached to religious institutions, these are people who attend re religious services regularly, um, uh, at least a few times a year, uh, that uh, the effects are even larger, right? Uh, so among Latino Protestants, it's actually a majority of them who say um, that uh, one or more of these faith-based approaches made them more likely to get vaccinated. It's four in 10 of African-American Protestants who attend regularly, 45% uh, um, uh, Hispanic Catholics and a quarter of, of white evangelical Protestants, again, um, who say, this was something that helped me uh, make the decision uh, to get vaccinated. So that's among the vaccinated. We'll take a couple of different looks at among those who still remain today hesitant 
um, or refusers. You know, it, it could be that uh, in the spring, uh, everyone who was going to be moved by a faith-based approach could have been moved, uh, but we don't find that. In fact, we find that people in the hesitant, who still are in the hesitant or refuser category, continue to tell us um, that these approaches would make them more likely to get vaccinated. So here I'm looking uh, just at all Americans, just among those who are hesitant. The dark bars are, are our latest data. The um, the dotted bars are March. We find basically still, even after so many have moved into the acceptance category, still about a quarter of those who are hesitant today say that these faith-based approaches would make them more likely to get vaccinated. And, um, and even one in 10 of those who currently say they refuse to get uh, vaccinated say that this might make them more likely uh, to, get, to get vaccinated. That number is actually slightly up uh, since, since March, so a little more openness uh, there. Um, the effects are slightly um, less uh, strong among those who seldom or never attend, but still considerable about one in five of even those who seldom and never attend services say a faith-based approach uh, would make them more likely to get vaccinated. Uh, but they're considerably strong among um, those who attend religious services regularly. About four in 10 of those who are hesitant uh, say, and, and attend religious services say that, that a faith-based approach would make them more likely. And notably, I think even about one in five of those who are uh, currently refusers and attend religious services reg regularly say this would make them more likely uh, to get vaccinated. So that's Americans kind of by attendance overall. I'm going to break this down just a little bit more to see some of these key religious groups, particularly a couple that are uh, at the top here who have been um, lagging behind um, other religious groups and other Americans. And, and the two we've been talking about a lot are Latino Protestants, white evangelical Protestants. Again, we here we see the opportunity. Uh, so this is, again, among people who are hesitant, uh, among Latino Protestants who are hesitant, Nearly half, 44%, say that uh, one or more of these faith-based approaches would make them more likely to get a vaccine. Among white evangelical Protestants, um, we have nearly three in 10 uh, who are hesitant today saying uh, a faith-based approach would make them more likely to get vaccinated. About one in 10, even of those who are refusers. The little asterisk there just means we don't have enough sample size in that category to break out, um, uh, to break out an answer. Uh, and among white Catholics, it's about three in 10. Um, as well. So again, even among those who are hesitant or refusers, we still see continued opportunities uh, to make a significant difference um, in, in the work uh, going forward. Uh, and then finally, uh, beyond the issues of hesitancy uh, are issues of access. And one of the things we asked um, in this survey was how, what kinds of barriers do people face and how uh, how much are they one of the reasons why they've not gotten vaccinated? So we asked specifically about taking time off from work and whether people were worried about missing work because of the side effects uh, perhaps of getting vaccinated, whether they lack childcare or lack transportation uh, getting uh, somewhere. And the, the ones I have up here are worries about taking time off uh, from work. So you can see about and again, this is also among those who are hesitant or refusers um, who have not gotten vaccinated. About a quarter of Americans say taking time off um, is one of the reasons they uh, worries about taking time off, one of the reasons they haven't gotten vaccinated. And among certain groups, you can see these numbers are really high. Again, Latino Protestants, young people, African-American Protestants, all around four in 10, uh, saying uh, this is a, a significant concern for them. Drops a little bit among Republicans and, and more down uh, around a quarter for white evangelical Protestants where it's less salient. But again, these are fairly large numbers. And then we ask about childcare and transportation, uh, less concerns there, but still among some groups, uh, about one in five say that each of these are um, significant barriers to them uh, getting vaccinated. So when we're talking about, I'm gonna hand it off to Ibu here in just a minute to talk about interventions and what we can do. But I think the data spells out, you know, a, a, a fairly clear recipe that, that really comes down to um, helping people overcome concerns and hesitancy, become more comfortable, uh, but and also removing these, uh, these access uh, challenges that, that people have uh, to getting a vaccine. The good news is that because religious communities um, are embedded in local communities, they're actually quite good at doing all of these things. They're trusted organizations. They do things like child care and transportation all the time. Uh, and are really well equipped um, uh, to do these kinds of interventions. So with that, Ibu, I will turn it over to you. Excellent, thank you so much. So, you know, a, a lot of the news has been bad about 
about uh, uh, COVID and the vaccine recently, right? And I think part of what's powerful about this data is that there are some things that you know we in the community of wanting to get of, of wanting to get people vaccinated should feel quite good about. And one is a, a real headline is that the numbers of people who have moved from hesitant to accepting are are quite remarkable, right? Uh, be just because you're accepting doesn't mean you're comfortable. And so we think we're at the kind of phase where, where we need to be focusing our efforts in encouraging the uncomfortable and in really vaccinating the persuaded. And it's absolutely clear that uh, faith-oriented, faith-sensitive ambassador and community health worker approaches have been an important part of this. And I just want to say, you know, uh, there's, there's a, uh, 200 or so people on this webinar. Thank you so much for joining. A lot of the people are leads and participants in the Faith in the Vaccine Ambassador Program. And thank you so much for your work, the work that you've done uh, in rural communities and urban communities and white evangelical communities and African-American Protestant communities, et cetera, et cetera. And the fact that you are on this call is kind of a beautiful illustration of the of the next slide that, that I wanna show here. Um, uh, it's this powerful partnership between IFYC and PRRI and the centrality of integrating learnings into practice, right? I think what's powerful about these numbers is that is this research informs practice and interventions and it leads to persuasion and vaccinations. And so we start with the national survey. We did our first one with PRRI uh, uh, in the late winter, early spring. We do then this kind of a thing. We, we do launches and discussions and we kind of distill key learnings. As we're doing this, we are recruiting ambassadors. We are integrating the learnings from these really comprehensive national surveys into the trainings that we're doing with programs like the Faith in the Vaccine Ambassadors that IFYC has launched. Those ambassadors from 200 different institutions, uh, uh, nearly 2,000 ambassadors, are then doing exceptional work in the field. They're persuading people. They're vaccinating people. We gather learnings from the field, right? So ambassadors will have uh, received surveys and phone calls from our evaluation team. What's working? What's not working so well? What should we do more of? What should we not do more of? We integrate those qualitative learnings from the field back into interventions and trainings, and they also feed into the kinds of questions we ask in the national survey. And this is a kind of a really powerful uh, um, research, learning, intervention, uh, uh, feedback loop that we've got with PRI and IFYC. Frankly, our hope is that we would run this in the spring and the summer, and then COVID would be over. Uh, we're not getting that hope, right? Uh, um, uh, we we, it is probably the case that this kind of research and intervention partnership uh, is gonna is is going to be very relevant uh, um, in for several months, perhaps over a year to come. Next slide. So a little bit about the uh, the Faith in the Vaccine Ambassador Program. So it's it is basically an iteration on a well known national and global model, which is a community health worker or a public health worker model, where you're you're uh, in, you're engaging trusted messengers in trusted uh, institutions to really advocate for and to facilitate key public health interventions like vaccinations. Uh, the uh, our the, the model that, that we were able to put into place at IFYC in partnership with PRI includes over 100 college campuses, uh, includes over 80 civic institutions, largely congregations and faith-based nonprofits, and we're approaching about 2,000 individual ambassadors. Our role at IFYC is first to partner with PRI on, uh, on the survey. Uh, uh, they do the heavy lifting on that. They're, in my mind, the best, uh, the best survey uh, shop in the nation. Uh, IFYC uh, recruits institutions and ambassadors. We train them, we resource them, we network them, we support them in the field. We glean qualitative learnings that then go back into the next iteration of the intervention and that feed into uh, uh, that feed into the quantitative surveys that PRI takes the lead on. So just to give you all a flavor of uh, the type of uh, colleges and universities we're working with. So this is what, uh, these are the colleges and universities nationwide. And, and many of you, again, are represented on this call. And I just, I just think that's awesome. You know, 
This is not a requirement, right? You're here to learn and to improve uh, the work that you're doing day to day, week to week to persuade folks and to get them vaccinated. Uh, one of the things you'll note is that there are a number of colleges and universities in urban areas, uh, quite proximate to African-American uh, communities and to Latino communities. And there's also a number of communities that are part of um, uh, the CCCU, uh, which is the more evangelically oriented consortium of, of Christian colleges. And so we really wanted to mobilize in communities that, that our research showed uh, particularly were uh, uh, needed proactive efforts around vaccination. Next slide. Um, this is the, the spread across the country. Uh, uh, you'll see there's a concentration in the upper Midwest and also in the Southeast. Um, the upper Midwest is looking pretty good, according to CDC maps. Um, uh, resource dependent, we hope to be able to do another really uh, uh, proactive kind of surge of ambassadors uh, in, in areas of the nation that are experiencing the other kind of surge, the negative kind, uh, a Delta variant surge. So, but this is the spread across the country. Uh, we next slide. We uh, we have um, particular geographic cohorts. There's one in Atlanta. There's one in Charlotte. And there's one here in Chicago. Uh, we wanted to show you some of the partners we're working with in Chicago. Thank you to John and the MacArthur Foundation. Thank you to Bob and the Chicago Community Trust. Thank you to Darren and the Joyce Foundation. Number of different uh, funders who are on this call who have funded this work. But this is the network of faith-based congregations and nonprofits that we are working with in Chicago uh, um, and, and, uh, and universities and seminaries. And if you look at the next slide, this is what the geographic uh, uh, spread of this is. And it's a, it's a powerful network, right? So nationally, it's a powerful network. And we, we do a good job at IFYC of creating these kind of geographic cohorts also. So these folks talk to each other, they partner with each other. It's amazing uh, to, to see examples and to hear stories of synagogues, mosques, and churches uh, uh, running clinics together and, and, and Muslims, Christians, and Jews showing up to get vaccinated together. It's powerful and beautiful interfaith cooperation work. Next slide. So wanted to just give you a couple of examples of success. And these are, you know, our evaluation team led by Dr. Shauna Morin at IFYC is terrific. And part of what they're doing is they're calling people and they're saying, what's working, right? So Reverend Alexis Kasim uh, in Northern Virginia, who as of three months ago was an IFYC alum and partner and now is IFYC staff. Uh, she's done such a great job with this. Um, uh, her uh, congregations, a uh, uh, little, Little River United Church of Christ, Mont Vernon Olive Baptist Church has hosted vaccine clinics that are particularly culturally sensitive. Uh, uh, there you see uh, uh, one, you know, one small victory, uh, but part of what they've taken re really seriously is childcare and transportation. And as Robbie said, uh, this is the kind of stuff that churches do all the time, right? And they do it really well. They address immediate needs in a way that's trusting and feels familiar and good. And, you know, God love the good people at Uber, uh, uh, but my wild guess is that a network of church, synagogue, mosque, gurdwara, temple vans uh, going door to door is, is, is actually what it takes to make people feel comfortable going to a vaccination clinic uh, rather than hitting hitting uh, uh, an app on an iPhone. And there's my wild guess is there's a reasonable, uh, uh, if you're not vaccinated, there's a reasonable chance you don't have the Uber app, Uber app on your phone and you're much more likely to, to, to say, I'll get in the church van and take the casserole and uh, uh, have the pastor say a prayer as I'm getting a shot that I'm accepting, but I'm still a little uncomfortable with, right? And that's what Alexis is doing in Northern Virginia. Next slide. So these are our good friends at uh, Dominican University and the provost, my friend Jeff Carlson and some of his students are, are on this webinar. They've done just a great job uh, partnering with uh, the Quinn Center of St. Uh, uh, Eulalia. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And part of the genius of this is that it's a social services center that does food distribution and they know that people show up there to get something that they really need. And they've used that as a site to engage folks on the vaccine. Right. So just the kind of thing that you do if you are 
integrate it into a community and you kind of understand where the community shows up and feels comfortable. You go to a place where, where they are at and you speak to them in a language that they understand. And that might mean Spanish and it might mean reference to Catholic saints and it might mean uh, you know, reference to the Quran if you're Muslim, et cetera, et cetera. But you're a trusted messenger at a trusted institution uh, engaging people, helping people feel comfortable in familiar spaces. So next slide. So you know, here's, here's our kind of three simple strategies to accomplish what, where we think we're at at this point, which is encouraging the uncomfortable and vaccinating the persuaded. Make it familiar, right? Do it at houses of worship, at block parties, at community centers, at, at schools. My friend, Reverend Dr. Suzanne Henderson, is, is uh, uh, on, this, uh, on this webinar right now. Uh, she leads our efforts in Charlotte. And uh, she uh, and her team had this brilliant idea of hosting a vaccine clinic at a soccer game where it was largely uh, Hispanic Latinx participants. And they had a doubly brilliant idea of raffling off season tickets to the new major league soccer team in the Charlotte area. And Suzanne said, we vaccinated somebody every three and a half minutes, right? So that's like a, that's somebody who understands a community and understands what it means means to show up in a familiar space, fake space, and to engage people where they're at. It's about helping people feel comfortable. It's about making it easy. Solve the solvable problems. Transportation is a solvable problem, right? Childcare is a solvable problem. Meals are a solvable problem. And we should trust the institution that like literally invented the casserole, right? Like, like the people who do this every Sunday and every Wednesday, they can do this when it comes to vaccine clinics. They've done it for the last six months and we should empower and resource and thank them for doing it for however much longer this crisis lasts and make it comfortable for folks, right? Just make it comfortable for folks. So, so the, this, uh, uh, the, the beauty of this is it's a solvable problem, right? If we're talking about 15% of the nation that's, that's refusing, there's a group of those folks that are really loud that kind of make that whole group feel bigger than it probably actually is. But if we're getting to 85% who are accepting, certain percentage of those are, are uncomfortable, you know, they're a little nervous, there's some barriers, we can solve that. We can solve that. Next slide. Um, so this is my second to last slide. So, so this comes from uh, WBEZ in Chicago, but I just, just, there are areas of Chicago. I'm right now at the IFIC offices, Chicago Board of Trade, right in the heart of downtown Chicago, okay? The areas that are over 75% vaccinated are a 30 minute drive from me right now, right? And the areas that are under 20% vaccinated are also a 30 minute drive from me, right? It is, impossible that 87% of Dixmore are vaccine refusers. That is just not the case. There are lots and lots and lots of those people who are a little uncomfortable, who have structural barriers, uh, work, transportation, childcare. But when I look at Dixmore, Fort Heights, Riverdale, I think to myself, with a targeted effort of culturally sensitive, perhaps faith oriented uh, ambassadors, we can look at that in three months and it can be 50, 60, 70%, right? Those are solvable problems right there, right? So forgive the football metaphor, but, but uh, I look at that and think to myself, um, I don't see, I don't think, uh, uh, I don't think that's terrible. I think to myself, we're in, the, we're in the red zone and we can do the work to get this ball in the end zone. Final slide. So, Listen, uh, um, this is a spreadable model, right? I mean, you know, we at PRI and IFYC, we'd love to have 500 colleges in our fall mobilization. We'd love to have a thousand congregations. That's great. But really, I think the power of, of an ambassador model is frankly, any county public board, board of public health could launch one, any state, Board of Public Health could launch one, right? The, it is. It doesn't. It's. It's not rocket science. Uh, it takes work, but it's a totally doable thing. 
And part of what we have done over the past six months is create a model for how this is done. We would love to work with various responsible entities across the country, uh, whether they're universities or, or hospital systems or state boards of public health to help them launch an ambassador program that focuses on their version of Dixmore and Harvey uh, 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 to double, triple, uh, 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 quadruple the vaccination rates there. We can help them with the training. We can help them with the, the, the uh, to understand this data. There are solvable problems here and, and we should solve them. That's it. Ibu, you're so good. They're solvable problems and we should solve them. And who knew it just was going to come down to casseroles. But uh, I think this, these data really, really help uh, to understand the context of this important problem. And, you know, my, my principal reaction to all of what you have said and, and the data you've been presented is, A, the data are there and B, the practices are there, that we really can put these two together and figure out uh, ways to make a really big difference in a number of people's lives. But um, I think we all wanna hear what um, the real pros have to say about it, not, uh, not my amateur reaction, but um, it is uh, lucky that we have Dr. Tanya Sorrell here to give her reaction to these data, uh, Dr. Sorrell. Thanks, John. And it's an honor to be here today with such a distinguished panel to talk with and, and to discuss not the work that not only Interfaith Youth Corps, uh, MacArthur and PRR I has done to really show that science and the faith community can walk hand in hand, especially as Ibu says, when we meet people where they're at, with honesty, education and compassion. Truly with COVID-19, our people perish from lack of knowledge. And so the talks that we gave really focused on addressing the common concerns that many, when they're experiencing something new, need to have, and as well as the misunderstandings caused by the disinformation that, that, that we've seen and that Natalie mentioned. Specifically, hesitancy, concern, and once again, that need for knowledge. A discussion of the history of the development of vaccine was provided with a foundation of it being almost 20 years in the making after SARS, uh, the first SARS or, or coronavirus in 2003, not just one year, which is the common opinion. And for truth and understanding, we really have to acknowledge the issues of the past concerning transparency and understanding the role of the government, distrust in medicine, particularly for Black Americans, Indigenous and other people of color who were and still receive unequal treatment. And that the explanation that with the COVID-19 vaccine, things were really done with more equity attempting to correct some of the health inequity and justices of the past, recognizing Tuskegee and the immortal cells of Henrietta Lacks, but realizing that those cells have led to the DNA knowledge that we had to be able to understand the DNA of the coronavirus. So truly, as they say in a t-shirt, a, a black girl has saved the world because the immortal cells of Henrietta Lacks paved the way for the DNA findings that allowed us to develop this vaccine. Then recognizing that what we see now in research and restoring justice to those who were oppressed fits not only with science, medicine, and faith. So from Kinsey Corbett, uh, a Black American as an NIH scientist that led that DNA um, review for the COVID-19, uh, for the coronavirus, and then Dr. Carrico, an immigrant female researcher who developed mRNA technology over 10 years ago, which has also been used for cancer treatments for several years, and how that work culminated with many of the people who were normally on the fringe. Many of those who may feel hesitant feel like if they're not at the table, they could possibly be at, on the menu. So truly, Black, immigrant, and female researchers were part of this development. And so at this time, when we look at health equity from a faith-based perspective, that's truly justice. That's truly those rivers of flowing justice, taking care of the oppressed, taking care of the poor and preventing death. And all of that was part of the decision-making and process in the development of the COVID-19 vaccine. Additionally, we discussed the vaccine is real. It's no respecter of persons, but those that are affected show the same inequities that we see in our marginalized groups, essential workers, minoritized groups, and rural groups with, with lack of access to healthcare. 
So vaccine acceptance is one of the first steps in health equity and moving towards justice. And then helping those participate and look through that fog of disinformation that Natalie mentioned to find truth, to recognize that loving others as they love themselves, their families and communities were part of the discussion that we had in, in these talks. And it was so helpful in looking at working through those myths to find the right path so that people were able to choose vaccine acceptance so that they and their loved ones could live during this pandemic. The, the overall goal and overarching goal from that is truly part of the work that we did in this project. And it's so glad to see some of the changes that we made incremental, step-by-step step, to help broaden the conversation and, and help people move past hesitancy toward vaccine acceptance. Wonderful, Dr. Sorrell. Thank you for your insights. And we'll hopefully uh, you will uh, chime in throughout the conversation and, and uh, um, inform us based on your, uh, your incredible background and, and findings. Um, I would just ask a couple of questions here of, of the group and uh, uh, note that the Q&A is open for others to put their questions in, and certainly even panelists, you can put questions in for one another. But maybe I just start with uh, um, picking up on the word incremental that Dr. Sorrell left us with to note that uh, I think when looking at these data that, that even relatively small incremental changes can be big wins in terms of the number of people's lives saved at this point. Ibu put us, you know, in a football metaphor, we're in the red zone. Um, and where where we're in the red zone, it's not necessarily, I mean, obviously in some communities in Chicago, based on what Ibu showed us, we still have this, the big chunks of, of population um, uh, to uh, to vaccinate, but but in many places it's, it is incremental. Um, but from your, your areas of expertise, whether it's statistical analysis, behavioral medicine, uh, running national programs, uh, what are the most important concrete next steps you'd like to see members of our audience take? And I'm noting that in the Q&A, people are raising their hands to be part of your ambassador program. So obviously there are, um, there's a lot of willingness here in this group. So uh, speaking to a uh, uh, maybe the, the choir, um, which still needs its practice, um, I'd love to hear, hear what you might preach and um, how you might share ideas for specific things that, uh, that audience members might do. Uh, and please feel free uh, for each each and an, each one of you, if you like, or or only one, uh, as you see fit to answer the question. Ravi, sure, I'll jump jump in. Um, I, I first, just before I say anything else, um, uh, Dr. Sorrell, you know, I knew you were you know a respected medical professional and leader. I did not know that you were a poet and a preacher. Uh, so I feel like we just got a seminar and a sermon. Um, all, all in one. So um, yeah, quoting, quoting Hosea, Henrietta Lacks, um, it's a nice weaving in there. So thank you for that wisdom uh, there. You know, I, I think it, it is right that um, the good news, uh, I, I was happy amidst all the bad news we're getting to see, for example, just that hesitancy has been cut in half since March, right? Just kind of holding on to that one little thing. So the refuser numbers haven't moved, but the hesitancy numbers have been cut in half. And that is due to the work that people on this call have been doing down in the trenches, on streets, in churches and synagogues and mosques and clinics and hospitals. Um, all that hard work is paying off, right? So I think that's one thing. Um, I, I'm not sure I would have thought, um, had I not seen the data, I would not have expected that it had been fully cut in half. But that's between March and June, right? That's a fairly short amount of time, particularly for survey data to shift. Um, that much when you're talking about people's behavior. I mean, that, that's a big shift in a short amount of time. So uh, while I think we're all rightly focused and worried about not getting to herd immunity and not getting there everywhere equally, um, that's really important. It's, I, I think, not losing sight of like, what we're doing is working. Uh, and the data suggests that doing more of it will continue to work, right? We haven't exhausted uh, uh, these things. It's a question really of scale. Uh, not not a matter of inventing kind of different things to do. The things that we're doing are actually working um, and just need to continue uh, to, to um, kind of be scaled up. Thanks, Robbie. Would anyone else like to take this one before we push along? Yeah, let me let me just, so um, I, I think what we should do is prepare for this to last for 15 more months and basically run our cycles that way. And so, it, uh, um, what does it look like? To, and, and so you think to yourself, what does it feel like to be a nurse in a hospital 12 months from now? Let's make sure that that terrific individual doesn't get burned out. 
right? In other words, we're not just thinking about the the uh, the surge next week. We're we have a 12 to 15 month game plan. And I think funders should think that way. I think government should think that way. I think universities should think that way. And I think part of the, what that would look like is, is let's actually plan for multiple cycles of research and ambassadors, research and ambassadors, research and ambassadors. It, that happens to be the tools that we have, right? If I was the ad council, I would, I would articulate a complementary strategy. None of this, none of what I'm suggesting uh, um, uh, negates other strategies. There's probably 10 strategies that need to work in tandem here, but this is not a one-time mobilization of ambassadors. It's not a one-time uh, research uh, um, project in June. It's probably four more cycles of this, and we should just, you know, we should we should put the arrows in our quiver for that, right? So, I mean, if, forgive the sports analogy, but there's a lot of sports teams you know, that they get to the fourth quarter and they put four up, right? Like we prepared for this, right? And they're, they're telling the other team, we prepared for the fourth quarter. We we came to play all 60 minutes or all 48 minutes. I think that's how we have to approach this. This is not a one-way thing. It's not a sprint. We need to prepare for what this is going to feel like next May. And by the way, if we stamp it out before next way, May, it's we did it precisely because we prepared for it to last until then. Right, we aggressively engage it over a marathon kind of um, uh, length of time. Very helpful, Ibu, and I think we all owe a huge debt of gratitude to everyone working on this topic, no matter what their role. But certainly, those who are directly healthcare providers that who uh, continue to face the the danger day to day, and and as we all know, even if you've been doubly vaccinated, you you may still be at risk of getting the virus. Um, particularly with the Delta variant and so forth. So just uh, sending our thanks to all those who are in the um, the thick of the marathon. And um, and I think you're right to, to prepare for the longer longer run. Um, we've got three good questions already in the Q&A. So let me just ask one more um, myself and then we'll flip over to the audience questions. But if you were to choose one finding from the study that could be a, you know, a headline in uh, national news um, or on reaching the largest number of, uh, of possible people, um, what would you think uh, would be most important for decision makers and the mainstream media to know and to, and to project out based on, on these data? Maybe Natalie, uh, do you want to uh, take it since the other two have uh, have spoken? Then we'll go to Dr. Sorrell before the other questions. Sure. So, you know, I th I think the the powerful thing about the this data is that it shows both the issue and the possible re resolutions. You know. It, most of what, what you see out there gives you a, a good um, sense of the landscape. Um, you know, of note, our data and our, our landscape aligns with the, most of those. So you, you can be pretty sure we're all, you know, getting the same basic story, which is good for surveys overall. Um, but, you know, the, the push forward here is what do we do about it? And, also not just focusing on hesitancy, um, but the barriers. And if you are a little bit concerned about the vaccine, but maybe you'd go get it, and then you have one or more of these logistical barriers, well, there goes any willingness you might have had. You know, so the, there might be plenty of people who are hesitant and just kind of on the, on the edge, that have these logistical barriers. So the, the more that we can highlight kind of the interaction of all these various pieces, I think is, is the big plus to the conversation that I would hope people would take away. Very important, subtle point that you wouldn't necessarily get just from the data itself. Dr. Sorrell, if you were on Fox News or you were on CNN reaching a very large number of people, what would you, uh, what would you want them to take away? Basically, the vaccine works. The vaccines work. What we're seeing now from people that are being exposed to the Delta variant are the unvaccinated, unvaccinated are those who are suffering. And that doesn't have to be. So, and, and part of the education and lack of knowledge is recognizing that 
no vaccine is 100%, but the vaccine works in preventing the long-term implications of COVID, the likelihood of hospitalization, ICU needs, ventilator being, being on a ventilator and death. So the vaccine works to keep you alive. That's the most important point. And then continuing with the follow-up, as Natalie said, if people hear that the vaccine works and then they have a way to get to it, then from that larger level or the mainstream media level and the actual boots on the ground, hey, the vaccine works and we can get you to it. We can have time or arrange, and this is something that the administration may also consider for many people who have difficulties getting off work or, or having time off work. Do the, does the, vac the vaccine, isn't, the virus isn't only working from nine to five. So the vaccine needs to work 24 seven too. The social determinants of health were part of the reasons and part of the inequities that left those minority, minority communities, the uh, underserved, the essential workers and those rural uh, residents without access, that's what left them vulnerable in the first place. So addressing those social determinants of health that prevent that access, the ability, if someone has to get in a car and they don't have a car and drive an hour, that's not gonna happen in a nine to five day. So being able to flex with the system to be able to really get the vaccine that works to the public that needs it. Well, Dr. Shrill, if I were a booker or a producer for one of these big uh, TV shows, I'd have you on in an instant to say that, that that sounds just right. If you wouldn't mind just keeping your mic open for a second, um, you could help with this first question, I think, from Casey Kelly, um, which is, does the Delta variant impact the conversation about vaccines? And if so, how? Do, would that, does that change your message um, or your thinking about these data, what we're learning about Delta? And then after Dr. Shrill, if anyone else wants to take that, uh, we'll turn it to you. What we are finding is that many people have gotten the message that the Delta variant is much worse, per se, than the original uh, variant. So that may make some move towards uh, potential vaccine acceptance. And then understanding how is going to be important, too. Um, and, and discussing, and this is part of the education process that our, that our, our people need as well, too. If the original variant that went through last summer only infect, affected or infected two or three people, but now the Delta variant infects six or maybe more, that's how we can say it's easier to catch. And then if you do catch it, it makes a thousand times more virus in your throat and lungs than the original variant. And think about that. You know, think about a thousand little bugs in you, a thousand little things in you growing and breathing. You don't want that. And then much worse at a, a, a magnitude times worse than the original variant. And really bringing the, the knowledge of science to the level of the public so that they can make a better and, and more informed decision. And that, that's an initial start to say, not only is it, is it easier to catch, it's more likely to cause more problems. And even those who are vaccinated, it might not infect them, but it's still, uh, growing inside the, and can be part of the, and can be transmitted. So understanding why a mask is helpful and that you're not only loving yourself, but you're loving others around you by wearing a mask as well too. Well, that couldn't be clearer. Uh, well said. Um, Ibu, Ravi, Natalie, anything on this topic that you'd like to add before we go to another audience question? Seeing some shaking of heads. Okay, well, let me uh, let me turn this uh, this next uh, one. Start with you, Ibu. Maybe um, Michael uh, McGarry asks, based on the data you have analyzed, how many Americans, percentage of population, or raw numbers would you hope to vaccinate as a result of this approach? Uh, I'm gonna. Robbie and Natalie will be able to do the the math in their head on this much quicker than okay. me. I'm, I'm the guy who takes five minutes to calculate a 20% tip at a restaurant. Ah. So, <laughs> you know, um, I will say I, I I really want people to focus on that slide where Northbrook is 80% vaccinated. Good for them, right? And Dixmore is 12% vaccinated. There are 10,000 Dixmores in this country. And what I mean by that, and that's obviously an illustrative metaphorical number, right? What I mean by that is there are places in which there are a lot, a lot of people who, who, if it was comfortable and easy, 
right? If it was familiar and facilitated, would get a vaccine. A church fan, a curry or a casserole, bring me a curry, bring somebody else a casserole, right? A church fan, a church or a mosque fan, a curry or a casserole, a $50 grocery gift card, a fun place to play for kids, a smiling, a smiling uh, uh, nurse um, who says, uh, um, uh, I'm going to sing you a song as a needle goes in. Like there's a lot of people waiting to get vaccinated who would get vaccinated. And, and that is not going to be an air strategy. That's going to be a ground strategy. And, you know, there's a beautiful thing about America and that's Americans, right? There are, there are, if there are 10,000 Dixmores, there are 10 million Americans who could drive the church van, could look after kids, could make a mean curry or a casserole, right? And I think, you know, that's why the, the kind of wonderful uh, animal called American Civil Society in its university, faith-based, nonprofit, foundation, congregational uh, manifestation, how do we do the Faith in the Vaccine Ambassadors times 100 its flavors across the country. This isn't about a thousand campuses in, in the IFYC PRI program, right? Uh, this is about a thousand communities launching their own version of that totally doable thing. Thanks, Ibu. Uh, and he's called upon, I think, Robbie and, and Natalie here to, uh, to crunch some numbers. I don't know if you've gotten your pencils out and been able to, to do so, but Robbie, over to you. Sharpen it up. Um, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, thanks for pitching me the hard stuff, Ibu. Um, uh, the, uh, well, here's one way to think about it. Um, you know, what's the potential uh, for this? So we kind of walk through, I'm going to take like white evangelicals as, as an example. The, the religious group that really is at the top of that list of being the most hesitant and refuser lagging behind. Uh, what do we know about them? They're also very prominent in, across the Southeast, right, where we see these hot spots from Arkansas to Florida to Texas. So they make up just a little bit under 15% of the population as a whole. But in those southeastern states, they make up about a quarter or more uh, of the population. So that's a big chunk. And nearly half of that group is hesitant or refusal. So if you're kind of looking at that, you're talking about, you know, 12, 13% of the population of those states who are white evangelicals who are hesitant and refusers, right? And that we say um, that, I mean, and that what they tell us um, is, uh, you know, pretty interesting they, that, that about a third of them uh, tell us that uh, these, are, these just these faith-based approaches uh, by themselves uh, would make them more, more likely to get, uh, um, uh, to get, so that's, you know, four to five percent of the population that we can move just with this one strategy right now in the most resistant places in the country. And when we're at a stage where we're at today, that kind of incremental movement is really important, right? That, that kind of five, six, seven percent uh, shift uh, could make a real difference um, in a community, especially these that have been plateaued out. You know, they've, they've made a lot, uh, changes early and then they've been very, very incremental. Um, but closing that gap between the sort of foot soldiers we have on the ground right now and being able to reach that bigger potential, which is a, quite a number of people that can make it, that just this one strategy can make a difference in, um, I think is where I'd, I'd focus is we've got a very big potential and closing the gap between the boots on the ground we have now and the number we need to reach that, I think is the, the game between uh, now and the next few months. Truly eye-opening in that respect, thank you. Uh, Natalie, you opened your mic as though you might wanna to add to the, to the data discussion. Just a very quick back of the envelope calculation um, with the uh, faith-based approaches, we had 26% uh, of our hesitants and 12% of our refusers say that one or more of these faith-based approaches might make them uh, more willing to get the vaccine. If that worked, that would equate to about five and a half percent of the population, which is about 11 million people. So, you know, you, you look at the percentages and it might look kind of low. This is among American adults, you know, even 1% equates to about 2 million people. Five and a half percent is more than 10 million people. So, you know, there, there's kind of a rough sketch of kind of, you know, a 10 million lives is a lot. 
Absolutely, Nelly. Thank you for uh, for very very specifically, I think, answering answering the question uh, from Michael and and for the broader answers too from Rabbi and Yibu. Fantastic. John, um, can I just jump in for for one yeah, second? Of course you can. Yeah. So so um, there are a number of people who work in philanthropy on on the on the participant list. I'm not going to say what you do in your day job, John. <laughs> but there's a number of people working in philanthropy. So I uh, um I so I this lift that PRI and IFYC have done starting in January up, up until now, uh, I would say we've probably spent a third of our time fundraising. And the fundraising, thanks be to God, has been successful. Uh, it's been over $5 million, of which four and a half million has gone to the ambassadors uh, and to survey out the door to support ambassadors and faculty members and universities and to do the actual surveys. If we had channeled that time, those hundreds and hundreds of hours into uh, finding more universities and more ambassadors, we could have probably doubled the size of the program, right? And so what uh, this is also a solvable problem, which is what does it look like for there to be kind of aggregate funding? So again, a huge thank you to the, to the supporters on this. We probably have 20 separate grants and that is actually not uh, not an overstatement, right? We probably have 20 separate grants that are supporting this. If there was one or two grants in the same amount, those that time goes into into more ambassadors, right? So it's it is an it's an interesting opportunity for all of us. And I say all of this is opportunity. I'm like in you know I see somebody's like the glass is half empty, and or somebody's like. No, the glass half full. I'm like, I see a dish of ice cream. I'm like the eternal optimist, right? This is a solvable problem, but there needs to be multiple levels of solution. Thanks, Ibu. I think I hear that as funders should write bigger checks with lower uh, lower um, uh, barriers to entry and do it more quickly. Um, but Dandre Young, I think here asked you a question in the chat, uh, Ibu. Does that include state and federal dollars, the five million you raised? I believe that's that's just straight philanthropy from. Oh, that's yeah, that's straight philanthropy. That's yeah. straight. Philanthropy. Yeah, so you know, I think I think one of the things that's obviously screaming out here is there are very very large dollars that are uh, you know coming from uh, the the federal system and sometimes flowing through states and and uh, and elsewhere. And you know, is it possible for some of those um, those funds to to intersect here? Maybe a little bit complicated with church and state, I suppose, as as concerns where we don't have that as private philanthropies. But um, but is there a possibility just to take this this comment seriously to um, to leverage or, or connect to uh, any public dollars uh, for a strategy like this. Sorry, just looking at the, so I think the answer to that is so uh, we're very we're we're thrilled that that uh, senior folks at the CDC Foundation have participated in this, including the president. Uh, uh, and thank you so much for that. I I um, I, I think that government adjacent entities like the CDC Foundation are the best kind of vehicles for supporting this, right? In, in part, it, uh, you you know, the kind of, uh, it, the church state thing is is not as relevant uh, uh, because they're, they are regulated a little bit differently. And the kind of, the paperwork is less onerous, right? So we looked at a number of federal grants um, we did not think that this fit as squarely in those. By the way, I think the Biden administration, you know, there, there's not that many countries I'd rather be in than the United States of America when it came to vaccination, mm -hmm. right? I'd love to pick my own region in that country, you know, but, but we have done a pretty good job at a macro level. Uh, the Biden administration has done great and there is more to be done. And I think that, again, CDC foundation type entities perhaps working with similar state, city, and county vehicles. And I think philanthropy, you know, people would pick, people pick up the phone calls of foundation presidents at every level, right? I think that there might be some advocacy for philanthropic leaders to do here. Curious about what other people think, of course. 
Thank you. Um, let's uh, jump to a question that, that comes, Ibu, out of your reference to geography, as in choosing the part of the country you could be in. Uh, Fritz asked a question about the lack of ambassadors in, say, the Mountain West, Western Plains, and Washington State um, on that map that you uh, that you you showed. I don't know if uh, Natalie or Robbie, you want to talk about any uh, geog geographical differences here, or, or Ibu, in terms of the outreach um, uh, approach that has um, that might reflect the way that that map looks. I think that's back to you, Evu. Um, yeah, I've been I've been talking a lot here, but this is probably I'm I'm probably the most relevant person here for this. So so uh, part of this is when when we did the first wave of ambassadors, the whole country was suffering from COVID, right? This is this is in March, and so we went to where our network was strongest, and so we have terrific leaders here in Chicago, like uh, like Jeff Carlson, Alexis Kassem in Northern Virginia, Suzanne Henderson in Charlotte, on and on and on, right? Uh, now, when we do this in the fall mobilization, we will go to our campus networks in Missouri, in Idaho, in Florida, and Texas. And even if we only have strong relationships with, uh, with say, five campuses in Texas or three campuses in, in Idaho, those campuses will know other campuses. Their related congregations will know other congregations. So, so part of what and this is just, it's how the virus is mutated, right? Uh, so to speak, uh, um, we will be much more geographically specific in further ways. Helpful, thank you. Um, I'm gonna uh, direct this one to Dr. Sorrell uh, coming from Eileen. Um, do we have ways to channel Dr. Francis Collins of NIH into these communities of resistance who see themselves as conservative or evangelical Christians, um, given that he has religious convictions and language to drive the message home, as well as the scientific credentials. Do you see possibility there for Dr. Collins or others with that with that mix? I think it'll be important for uh, providers at all levels, from the macro net, uh, level nationally, like Dr. Collins, as well as local and and state level providers. Um, unfortunately some of the original providers of, of scientific information became part of the, the negative narrative of, of disinformation during this course. And so sometimes when they're on, on, on camera, that's an immediate turn the, uh, turn the channel. And so looking at people from all levels, nationally, but uh, particularly locally. It's the local outreach and, and as Ibu mentioned, the, the, the people at the ground level. And even saying, go to, talk to your provider, talk to your healthcare provider, someone that you trust. And then recognizing that with the narrative that Natalie mentioned of disinformation, it's gonna be important for the message to be able to get through that fog of disinformation too. Talk with someone you trust. Facebook may have information or memes, but all, all levels aren't created equally. So talk to someone that you, that you trust that has, who has medical knowledge or, or experience in, in, and that you feel that you're comfortable to be able to have that discussion with. Uh, your local leaders and your religious leaders are part of that conversation as well. And hopefully as we continue to have additional out, outreach, that will be part of the discussion too. Dr. Sorrell, thank you. Um, others want to pick up on, on this question at all, or, or should I uh, keep going with questions? I'll chime in just to note that um, when we talk about these faith-based approaches, you know, Robbie put up a list of things that we did ask people about. Some of the most impactful approaches of that set of things were the ones where a religious congregation you trust or a religious community you trust holds a forum. They bring in information. You know, the, those were particularly appealing among that set of items. So religious communities engaging with um, the Dr. Collinses and the Dr. Sorrells and, you know, of the world is, is a, has the potential to be very powerful. And Natalie, I think it also works to, to counter the narrative that science and spirituality don't walk together. Absolutely. If God created the heavens and the earth, and certainly he knows about physics. If he created all the plants that are, that are, that are here and everything is good, then the, then, then the, the plants that, that we've been able to derive medications from are also part of that blessing. If Luke was a physician, 
as a disciple of Christ, then certainly a physician and is someone who knows science and can be able to minister in that sense, both medically and, and spiritually as part of that discussion. Dr. Shmuel, I really think you are the secret weapon here to this whole uh, this whole thing, combining science and, and faith. I think it's, uh, it's right there in front of us. Um, let me flip to a question from Lawrence Whitney, who asks uh, to go one step further in terms of resistance, but focusing on the actively discouraging uh, group. So does the data provide a window on those who might be vaccine hostile? Um, and have you found any strategies that are effective in reaching vaccine hostile people who are trying to actively encourage other people not to get vaccinated? I'll tell you that we, we don't have any, unless Natalie can figure out an angle that I'm not thinking of, we don't have any data specifically on people who are uh, like so hostile that they're discouraging um, others. Um, it, it is, I think, notable to me that, that we still have, again, about one in 10 of even the folks who are in that refuser category say that they would be responsive to a faith-based approach. Um, Again, if, the, if they're in that refuser category saying, I will not get the vaccine and yet still tell us, oh, well, I might be, I might be a little more open um, with a with faith-based approach. I think that's some hint. And, and I'll say one thing that's maybe bigger than that, that um, part of, I mean, we haven't talked about it a lot. I had a couple, we had a couple of slides on the, on the partisanship here, but the big elephant in the room, particularly with white evangelical communities is partisanship, right? This has just become a partisan football. And Dr. Sorrell mentioned uh, like Dr. Fauci and others who were early on getting kind of wrapped up in the partisan scrum uh, that, that we had, um, you know, when, the, when we were first kind of talking about vaccines. So part, we're still unraveling ourselves from that. And one of the reasons why I think this is um, uh, somewhat powerful is that if you go straight at people uh, with a kind of persuasive message, you know, that, that could sound political or whatever, it's just going to bounce right off. And I, but I think one of the things that if you can get a conversation happening in a synagogue, a mosque, a church, um, uh, those are places that talk about everything, right? I mean, it's, they're inclusive uh, conversation spaces. And particularly with this strategy, one of the problems and one of the things we've heard uh, from pastors, right, is that they don't want to put themselves in the political crosshairs, right? So they've been timid about kind of holding a clinic or something like that. But one of the things that we're finding is that if you have a 20 something year old or a 20 year old who's been raised in that church, who's off to college, who gets uh, recruited as part of these faith in the vaccine ambassadors and they go back to the church and say, hey, I'm doing this this summer. I'd like to set up a, a forum uh, and the pastor's facilitating something that their young person is doing. That actually gives the pastor some wiggle room of saying, I'm not forcing this on the church. This is like one of our uh, youth that we all know and we're supporting what she's doing this summer. It's a kind of side door that I think makes it a little bit safer uh, to have the conversations. And at this point, um, we're really looking for ways to finesse the problem, right? Taking it head on, I think sometimes isn't the best, but finding ways to kind of work around, to go around, to finesse it. And I think that's, I think the beauty of what a lot of this does. And often the way you do that is because you're, you're tapping organic relationships, embedded institutions that are already in communities and trusted. Um, and it just makes for an easier flow of things. That's a really good point, Robert, and as well, one of the important ways that we in, in the medical field use those conversations uh, to just open the door is called motivational interviewing. Uh, first, you recognize that no, you don't go up against someone. You say, you know, I, I understand that you that you have some questions and concerns. Is it all right if we if we have if I tell you a little bit about it, or you tell me about what some of your concerns are? Ask whether you can have that conversation. Then it's not condescending. You're not putting someone down. You're really, as they say, meeting them where they're at. You know, tell me what are some of your concerns about the COVID-19 vaccine? If they're very plain and simple, such as, well, this was, all, this was only developed in a year. Uh, you know, it, it may have an influence with 5G. Then you can provide some critical knowledge to try to address some of those concerns in discussing. Well, we know it actually, they've been working on the, the foundation for this for, for many years and then providing that information. Tell me, how do you feel now that you've heard this? This Tell me how that, tell me what you think about that now that we've had this conversation. You may not make a move or a change then, but you, as, as we said, inch by inch, may be able to incrementally make that progress. And that that's where, little by little, continuing to have that grassroots level connection will be helpful. 
Dr. Shrell, if you wouldn't mind uh, keeping the mic, um, we now have uh, exhausted, I think, the audience questions for the moment. So we'll just do a, a round here at the end of anything that you wish to leave the audience with or something you wish you'd had a chance to be able to address. We'll start with you, Dr. Shrell, and we'll come back uh, around and end with Ibu. Well, sure, and, and thanks again. You know, we, we've been talking a lot about not only the COVID-19, the vaccine, and as well, we mentioned a lot of the social determinants of health that, that actually wrapped around this and actually made this pandemic, not only a pandemic of the, the virus, but also the social ills, the political ills, and a lot of the structural and systemic ills that we see in our society. As we try to look at moving forward, we may want to ask ourselves, do we want to quote unquote return to normal? You know, if, if we look at this from a religious context, if this was God kind of shaking the world to get our attention, we might want to take a look around to evaluate. Is it okay for us to see people living on, at penthouses when right outside there's someone there with a sign and they're not able to eat? Is it okay that just because of the color of someone's skin, they may have difficulties obtaining housing, obtaining jobs, obtaining that goal of working toward the American dream. As we look at the flag and recognize that all of us are, are working towards that more perfect union, that's a work in progress. It's not an actual there. This may be a time that we take a look and see what are we doing and how do we want our new normal to look? You know, my minister said that the COVID lockdown was like being in the whale as Jonah. So do we wanna go back to our old ways when we're spat out on the beach? Or do we really wanna to start to address some of the issues really that God calls us as faith to address? Working with the poor, helping the oppressed, fighting for the oppressed, and developing how we work to have our, our world in better order. And in that way, we're not only addressing a lot of the social ills and social determinants of health that made the plight of the COVID-19 vaccine of virus so problematic, but we're also moving forward in what we can see for our future as well. And then we may truly have learned what it is to, as we say, love others as we love ourselves. Dr. Sorrell, thank you. Uh, Robbie, last words from you. Oh, Dr. Sorrell, I'm sad I have to follow that. Um, uh, I just want to say amen. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would say, uh, just uh, kind of going back to the big picture, because I, I do feel like there's so much bad news coming at us right now, uh, but to say we, the things that have been, uh, all the hard work that has been done on the ground, medical communities, churches, synagogues, mosques, community leaders, people who have been working, in, um, uh, the ambassadors that have been on the ground, knocking on doors, talking to people, um, it has made a difference, right? Um, again, the hesitancy rate has been cut in half between March and June. That's a big deal. Um, and we have a significant number of people, particularly in communities that have been lagging behind, still telling us that this strategy would be effective and would help them. Uh, so I think we've got the opportunity laid out right in front of us. Uh, the last thing I, I just want to kind of point to that we haven't talked about um, that I think goes along with what Dr. Sorrell is having, uh, saying, is that we did find that um, uh, when we asked about different kinds of things, the ways you could talk about it. Uh, that two things kind of stood out among the hesitant, um, and that was uh, that that if we um, uh, statements that people said would make them more likely, hearing the statement made them more likely to get vaccinated, and they they go pretty much together and right in line with what Dr. Sherrell was having. And the, the two were um, that by getting vaccinated, you'd be making a decision that protects human life, and by getting vaccinated, you'd be helping to protect the most vulnerable members of your community. In both cases, a majority of the vaccine hesitant said kind of thinking about thinking about it that way would make them more likely uh, to get vaccinated. So I really do think it is, um, we've had some evangelical leaders who have stood up and said like, this is about loving your neighbor, right? Um, it's in it, kind of flipping it from getting stuck in a kind of, I, I think, you know, to my mind, a distorted view of what human like individual freedom is to a, a kind of more open view of what being responsible and loving my neighbor um, is. Very powerful, thank you. Uh, Natalie, how about your last, your last thoughts? So I did, it occurred to me as we were, the conversation was um, progressing that we didn't really discuss kind of the, the impact of what happens with the non-religious part of American society, which is, you know, a, 
roughly a quarter of the country. Um, the religiously unaffiliated are higher on the um, scale, but I did Uh, our society is so deeply connected by religion that even 12% of religiously unaffiliated people say that these religious approaches could move them toward vaccination. So, and that's among both hesitant and ref refuser unaffiliated. So that shows how deeply embedded in our culture um, religion is, even for those who don't necessarily need to have, have science and religion connected, although certainly there are many who do. Um, you know, so the, this is kind of a, an across the board um, approach that you see in our society. You know, our, our hospitals are religiously affiliated, many colleges and universities are religiously affiliated. So it, while we, we talk a lot about specific religious groups, this is not only a for the religious conversation either. So I, I just wanted to add that as we wrap up. I think that's so powerful. And in so many areas of philanthropy, this idea of targeted universalism is an important concept, which is if you target a, a community, for instance, you target uh, you know, an African-American community in the city, it doesn't mean you don't care about all the souls in that community. It means that you're in fact are starting in a certain place and, and serving everyone. And, and that's a little bit, I think, Natalie, your point, um, that some of these messages, loving one's neighbor, you know, though that may seem like it comes right out of a certain gospel or otherwise, you know, it is something that may resonate um, for all of us and on behalf of all of us. So uh, I think that's extremely, extremely powerful. Two minutes left, Ibu Patel, bring us home if you would. Thank you, John. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Becca and Catherine and Ian and everybody who makes this work, our, our entire teams. A huge thank you to the philanthropists who've supported this, the foundations, major, major thank yous to the ambassadors and the faculty leads and the colleges and the congregations who are a part of this. One of the things I want to say to you is, is, you know, I can't imagine being a nurse or a doctor right now and just how challenging it must be. And frankly, just how, uh, just the breadth of fresh air uh, that you as an ambassador, like showing up and doing your appropriate role alongside somebody who might've been yelled at or had been spat at or whatever, you know, here you are showing up and saying, hey, you know, let's, let's, uh, you, you are a shot of enthusiasm. And I just, I can imagine that in addition to all the other good things you do, you are super helpful to the people in our medical establishment who have been heroes and are, you know, probably pretty beleaguered right now. All right. Well, I think that that brings us to a close. Uh, thanks, everybody, for making time and uh, really appreciate this this panel. Maybe we can um, at least virtually give a round of applause for this uh, this great group. And, and thanks to um, to each of you for the work that you're doing to bring about an equitable and inclusive uh, recovery. And, um, and hopefully uh, these messages will continue to resonate as they have. So thanks, everybody, and have a great day.